For many beachcombers, the vision of a shrimp boat stirs the imagination. Thoughts of bountiful harvests and a life at sea filled with ocean adventure have caused many a soul to pursue a life in commercial fishing. However, most of us simply enjoy the delicacies these vessels produce in restaurants and markets. Fishing cultures have flourished in many small coastal communities for most of the 20th century. Many of these communities grew from businesses that support a shrimp fishery. The chain begins with the fishermen who live their lives on the sea and stretches to the savory delicacy that we enjoy on our plates. But what do we really know about shrimpers and catching shrimp? Legend has it that for more than 2,000 years, shrimp have been harvested by fishermen around the world using dip nets and cast nets in shallow waters. However, shrimp could not be used as a viable seafood commodity because the essential ingredients required to build a fresh seafood industry were either unavailable or not well developed. Prior to the 1800s, there were no proven preservation techniques or means of reliable transportation. Profitable fresh shrimp commerce was limited to populated urban areas such as Charleston, Savannah, Havana, and New Orleans. By the late 1800s, many of these problems had been overcome. Shrimp were cooked in a strong brine, adding several weeks to the shelf life. In pubs, these salted shrimp were often given away like peanuts or popcorn to whet the appetites of patrons. But Civil War reconstruction efforts in the form of expanded railway systems were finally reaching coastal villages. Increased competition among steamship lines was lowering transportation costs and improving its availability. Fresh shrimp could now reach the lucrative New York City market. Still, at the turn of the century, supply was limited. Most shrimp were taken from inshore rivers and estuaries using dip nets, cast nets, or beach seines. Hall seines yielded a higher catch, but using them was more expensive and much more labor intensive. Often six to eight men or horses were needed to handle a large seine. One end of the net would be staked or held in position on the beach while a small rowboat paid out the neatly stacked net. With the rowboat traveling in a circle back to the staked end, the crew would slowly haul in the net, forming an ever narrowing circle and herding the shrimp until they could be easily landed with dip nets or cast nets. This simple form of fishing required little capital investment. Sometime between 1900 and 1902, the first major technological advancement in the fishery was introduced by Solicito Salvador, who later became known as Mike, an Italian merchant mariner who entered the business in Fernandina, Florida in 1899. Salvador immediately began experimenting in all phases of the industry, from production to marketing. To improve the speed and efficiency of his seining operation, Salvador equipped his boat with a small one-cylinder gasoline engine. This is believed to be the first time a power-driven boat was used in the shrimp fishery and most likely occurred in 1901. By 1917, the auto trawl had gained universal acceptance in the commercial fleet. The typical shrimp trawler was a 25-foot long wooden boat with a 10-foot beam and a net displacement of three or four tons. The boats pulled one trawl and usually had a one or two-man crew. Both two and four cycle engines were common. All were gasoline fueled, typically generating about 15 horsepower. On the eve of America's entry into World War I, the essential features of today's worldwide shrimp industry were present along the Atlantic coast. Today's fresh shrimp trade with its vast network of markets and sophisticated distribution system descends directly from the efforts of the East Coast pioneers. Shrimp boats would become bigger and more powerful with greater range than the 1917 fleets, but these are differences in scale, not basic technology or methodology. In fact, the auto trawl of today, although considerably refined, remains basically unchanged in its design. The specific components that did change improved the overall efficiency of the harvesting operation. Boats grew larger and more seaworthy, and added more horsepower to pull more and larger nets. Holding capacity and deck space increased. When the larger catches became too heavy to be pulled on board by hand, winches were employed with block and tackle mounted on A-frames to facilitate the work. 
U.S. shrimp landings were only 10 million pounds in 1890. By 1930, the landings had shot up to 88 million pounds and the boom was only beginning. As the 25 and 35 foot class trawler swept aside the Seine, now 40 and 50 foot vessels were replacing the smaller boats. The increased length could only be accommodated by completely redesigning the boats being built. The skills and craftsmanship the immigrant boat builders brought with them from their homelands now came into play. As the shrimping industry evolved, there was more and more demand was placed for more and more shrimp. And of course, they knew that they needed larger nets and larger nets were developed. But with that, they needed larger boats. They needed more power to pull the larger net. And what they tried to do, they tried to take the same traditional plan that had been built uh, and, and expand this and stretch it. Well, you could only stretch it so far and, you, and it would only accommodate so much power. In 1941, my father, Jimmy Dionis, came here from Greece and he redesigned and drew new plans for a new boat. Uh, in the 60s, uh, in the 50s, we saw boats going 55 to 60 feet. In the 60s, they were up to 70 feet and larger. And thus, they accommodated the more power that was needed to pull the larger nets. There was the space on the boat that was needed. And that was the super trawler. Yeah, that was the birth of the super trawler as we know it today in the shrimping industry. These larger vessels allowed fishermen to venture into deeper waters using more powerful engines to accommodate larger nets. World War II was now over and a period of prosperity swept the nation. Surplus machinery and new technologies fueled a boom in U.S. industries. Gear innovations and fishing ground explorations expanded. The sons of Mike Salvador, Felix and John located the dry Tortuga pink shrimp grounds near Key West in 1949. A few years later, the massive brown shrimp fishery was developed in the offshore waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Shrimp boat yards sprang to life throughout the region. One of the greatest milestones for the fishery was the development of the quick freezing process. Shrimp was no longer a perishable product subject to market price fluctuations. Overnight, shrimp became a stable commodity, with the producer having a modicum of control over when he wanted to sell. This solidified many of America's seafood packers and processors as cornerstones in the seafood industry. Freezing paved the way for the phenomenal shrimp import business of today, which imported over 450 million kilograms of shrimp in 1999, valued at nearly four and a half billion dollars. This industry alone employs over 25,000 workers. Over a few decades in the middle of the 20th century, the shrimp industry exploded. Marine electronics of all kinds opened new frontiers. Boats were no longer limited to nearshore fishing and returning to the dock by nightfall. Diesel engines replaced gasoline. Nylon dipped webbing replaced tarred cotton. Boats were now big enough to be outfitted with galleys, bathrooms, and sleeping quarters. During this time, crew size went from one or two men to three or four, as the evolution from a single net to double rigs became almost universal, later evolving into the popular four-banger in the 1970s. So as regulations have come down for, for different uh, uh, applications, be it in the turtle or in the fish or, or whatever it might be, um, again, that resourcefulness that I spoke about, about the fisherman, he's adapted to that and worked towards those goals. And uh, he's, uh, he's a, a good steward, I believe, the fisherman is. Uh, for if you're in this business, uh, you're in it for your life. The 1980s brought the development of sea turtle excluder devices called TEDs. A TED is a specially designed large hole that allows sea turtles to escape after entering the net. Many shrimpers initially resisted the development of TEDs, primarily because the original TED design, a device built by the federal government, was complicated, expensive, and cumbersome. Furthermore, the TED was believed to lose a great deal of shrimp and posed a danger to deckhands in rough sea conditions. A network of university and federal and state agencies tested a design built by fishermen that was simple, less expensive, and 97% effective at excluding sea turtles. 
The Shrimper Design TED was approved by the federal government in 1989. TEDs have been required in all shrimp nets since that time. Turtle excluders have been around for a long time. Uh, in, uh, on our coast, the South Atlantic coast, uh, they were jelly ball shooters. But off South Carolina and Georgia, they had, the hole had to be large enough to exclude turtles because there's so many turtles here. Uh, if you didn't exclude a turtle, the turtle would uh, plug up the hole and your net would, would load up with jelly. In 1986, the handwriting was on the wall. Lawsuits were being filed uh, by the environmental community and even the Department of Interior was threatening to sue the Department of Commerce for NIMPS not enforcing the TED regulations. But the problem at that time was that there was only one allowable TED, and that was the uh, revised version of the NIMPS hard TED. It was a collapsible version that was very complicated, had humming wires, bungee cord, and a lot of other stuff in it. Just too complicated for a shrimp boat. What we did, we invited the environmental community, Greenpeace, Audubon, Center for Marine Conservation, and others to Cape Canaveral to demonstrate the shrimper design TEDs, and they included the Georgia Jumper, the Matagorda, Texas Ted, the Cameron, Louisiana Ted, the Parrish Ted from North Carolina, and the Morrison Ted from South Carolina. Uh, we managed to certify a lot of these. And this opened the door to acceptance by the industry of Ted's. We have a 98% compliance rate, uh, but nobody ever seems to know that. But every time a turtle washes up on the beach right away, it's associated with, you know, the, the commercial fishing industry, which uh, we're guilty by association. Nobody's ever been able to really prove it, but just by association, uh, that's the uh, perceived image that we have. And sometimes perception becomes reality. Many people thought shrimpers just didn't care about these turtles that were caught accidentally that they simply didn't want to risk losing their catch. In fact, shrimpers had been using similar gear to exclude jellyfish for over 50 years. The shrimpers objected to the forced use of impractical gear and the unwarranted sole responsibility for the declining status of sea turtles. Of all man's interactions with sea turtles, the shrimp industry probably has done more than any to minimize their effect on turtles. Beach development and its side effects, such as overlighting and seawalls, has a great impact on turtle survival. Contrary to widespread belief, it is unlikely that the shrimp industry was the major cause of sea turtle population declines. Legal sea turtle fisheries operated for centuries throughout the Caribbean, Mexico, and in other parts of the world. This fishery slaughtered thousands of turtles each year in the U.S. alone. Future turtle generations were sacrificed to supply the great demand for eggs that were believed to be an aphrodisiac. This directed fishery is likely to have had the greatest impact on sea turtle populations, and in some countries, government-sanctioned turtle fisheries still exist. The research to improve TEDs continues. Most successful gear refinements are directly attributable to the experience and expertise of the shrimpers themselves. Shrimp nets are now equipped with fish escape holes too. Laws were implemented in the 1990s that require shrimpers to reduce the amount of fish they catch. The escape holes are called bycatch reduction devices, BRDs or birds. Many fisheries biologists believe the need for this law was based on interpretive fish population data and the benefits remain controversial. The biggest problem we have with the birds uh, today is that the the environmentalist or the, the pressure that's coming upon us is to reduce the bycatch. But we've already reduced the bycatch with the turtle excluder. And the people today are not taking that into account. Nevertheless, regulations require shrimpers to use fish reducing gear that can cause significant shrimp losses. At the turn of the 21st century, research continues to develop better gear for releasing fish. Today, the southeastern U.S. shrimp industry from the Carolinas to Texas lands over $500 million worth of shrimp, which employs tens of thousands of people. Shrimp landings in the southeastern and Gulf regions of the U.S. for 1998 reached 294 million pounds, worth approximately $550 million. Its sophisticated vessels and distribution systems have certainly evolved for the better, 
while profit margins have tightened due to increasing operating costs and competition. Interestingly, the nets in use today are not so different from the nets used 100 years ago. Turtles, fish, and other marine species can now escape the net through certain refinements, but the trawl's original design remains basically unchanged. The shrimp industry, through innovation and collaboration, has set a bold example in the sustainable use of renewable natural resources. Equally compelling is the legacy of American ingenuity and perseverance that exists in the people who continue shrimping today. In a world where corporate buyouts typically dilute the family and cultural color in any large industry, many in the shrimp industry are direct descendants of its pioneers a century ago. It is an industry made primarily of middle-class mom-and-pop businesses, the backbone of this country, and their story is a chapter in what is known as the American Dream. The seafood industry provides that uh, uh, flavor, that, that, that touch of culture that, uh, that we want to have here. It's one that we brought with us and one that we, we want to keep, and I, I believe that that's an important part of our lives. It, it makes us whole.